Amen. I hope you really thought about what we've just sung, and you'll make that your prayer. Well, if you're like me and most people, you want this pandemic to be over. You know, we're creatures of habit, and we function best when we're in our familiar routine. And when this pandemic is over, I think that we want things to be back to normal. You know, there's people talking about a new normal. We don't want to hear that. We want things to be back to the old normal. We want to live uh, without any of these current restrictions, right, that we, that we have on us now. I want to issue a warning to us all, and it's this. Are you listening? My warning is that... I hope that you don't want to get back to your spiritual normal. That is, I hope that as far as spiritual things are concerned, that you, want, you don't want to go on with business as usual. I hope that you don't want your spiritual life to be just like it always was. I hope that you want a better spiritual life, better than what you would call normal. Because if what we're going through does not do something for your heart, it's been a waste. This whole pandemic has been a waste if it doesn't impact you and bring you to a spiritual level that perhaps you weren't on before. You know, There's lessons to be learned, and I I should ask you this. Sheltered in place as we are, it's a tremendous opportunity to seek the Lord. Are you? Are you taking advantage of the present opportunity to seek God, perhaps, uh, more than you ever have before? And if so, has God taught you anything during this time? And if he has, I hope that you're determined To never forget the things that God taught you during the shutdown. Don't let those lessons ever slip away. Which brings me to a need. We have a great spiritual need, and God promises to meet that need. I was just thinking about James chapter 5 and verse 16, which says, Confess your faults one to another, And pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God promises in that verse to heal Christians. The restoration of a Christian, if you look at that passage, is based upon that person's repentance. It's based upon that person humbly opening or owning up to their sin before God and before others. It's dependent upon you seeking God for the welfare of others. And as a result, he says, you'll be healed. You'll be brought back to normal, if I could put it in those words. What God calls normal. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I want to talk about back to normal, God's definition of it. Our Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful that we have these few minutes together in your word. I'm thankful that your word is a sword that is able to pierce and divide between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is able to lay bare the very thoughts and motives of our heart. And I pray to that end tonight. Do that work, Spirit of God. You wield the sword. It's your sword. Wield it as we look into the scripture this evening. And Lord, bring us bring us back to your definition of normal. Create in us what is the normal Christian life. Give us that desire and show us how it's possible in Jesus' name. Amen. So, at this time, I I would ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. 
while you're turning to Ephesians chapter 5, I want to talk to you, what is normal? What is the normal Christian life? You know, there's a book by that title. What is the normal Christian life? Well, the normal Christian life is a spirit-filled life. It is the Christ life. Very simply, the normal Christian life is Christ seen in you. Christ visible in your life. And there are really two things that have to happen in order for Christ to be seen in your life, in order for you to have a normal Christian life. Number one, there has to be on your part a yielding. Has there ever been or need there be a reaffirming of that full surrender of your life to the Lord tonight? I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body, yourself, a living sacrifice unto God. There has to be that yielding. If you'll ever live a normal Christian life, there has to, first of all, be that yielding of yourself to the Lord. That you, as Peter says, that you sanctify the Lord in your heart. That is, that you set Jesus as Lord of your life. You yield to him. And then a second uh, part of what a normal Christian life is about is not only yielding, but a depending. You must learn, having yielded to the Lord, your whole life, your whole self, total dependence upon him to live this life. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so, what does a Christian, uh, what does a, a normal Christian life, uh, what is it? It is a yielding to Christ. It is a dependency upon Christ. It's not I, but it's Christ. Well, if that's what it is, what does a normal Christian life look like? What, how, how does Christ appear visible in the Christian life? How is Christ visible in your everyday life? What does that look like? Well, I've had you turn to Ephesians chapter 5 for that purpose. Here in this passage, chapter 5 and chapter 6, we get a, a clear picture of what a normal Christian life is supposed to look like. Now look at it with me. In verse 18, And be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is the normal Christian life. That's normality in the Christian life. That's not an exceptional thing, but that is a normal thing for every believer. It is a command in this passage, and it is a command that is continual. Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Be continually under His influence. Be continually yielded to Him. Be continually depending upon Him so that Christ can be seen in you. And when that happens... The normal Christian life looks like this. Verse 19, first of all, there is rejoicing. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. A normal Christian life is a life of rejoicing. It is a singing in your heart. It's a singing heart. And you know what? Rejoicing is different from being happy. Happy depends upon happenings. Happiness depends upon circumstances in order for you to be happy. But rejoicing that we're talking about here is not living in denial, but rather it is giving all to God and trusting Him in it. And when you do that, you'll be rejoicing. But the normal Christian life is not only one of rejoicing. Look at verse uh, 20 of chapter 5. It's one of thanking. 
giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's praising the Lord all the time. It's thanking him for everything, the good and the bad, the big and the small. It's thanking him. It's praising him. And you know what? You don't have to understand uh, what's going on in order to be thankful and praise God for everything. You simply have to be convinced that God is going to use whatever is entered into your life for his glorious purposes, and that's enough. And then you can be thanking him. But a normal Christian life is not only rejoicing and thanking, it's a loving life. In verse 21 of chapter 5, it says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. In verse 25, it says, Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a loving life. And there are in these verses that I want to share with you, before I do, think of the source of, of love. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 18, chapter 5. Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. So if you're filled with the Holy Ghost, if you are yielded to him and depending upon him, then love is going to be shed abroad already in your heart, out through your life. You'll have a loving life. And it will be expressed in three main ways. Now, isn't it interesting that one of the ways in which our love is expressed to others is through submitting. Verse 21 and also uh, verse 22 on the part of wives. But verse 21, submitting. Obedience. And in verse uh, 33, uh, respect or reverence of a wife for a husband. Obedience and respect and chapter 6 and verse 2, children, honor your father and your mother. And so submitting is an expression of love. You express your love by submitting. As a, a wife submits to her husband, she expresses her, as she respects her husband, she expresses love. As a child obeys their parents, they express honor. And that's love. But there's, a, uh, there's also in this same sixth chapter, in verses 5 uh, through 9, there is a submission on the part of a master and a slave. It talks about that as being an aspect of love. A, a servant-master relationship is a reflection of your love, submission to Jesus. You do it as unto the Lord. And then another main way in which love is expressed uh, in the normal Christian life is through not only submitting, but through sacrificing. In verse 25 of chapter 5, Husbands are called upon to love their wife as Christ loved the church and sacrificed himself for it, gave himself for it. And then in that same fifth chapter, a couple of verses down, in verse 28, husbands are said to ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And so love in a normal Christian life is expressed not only by submitting, but by sacrificing, by placing others ahead of yourself, by placing others before yourself. In other words, a death to self. You can't love others until you die to self. And by the way, nowhere in the scripture are we told to kill ourselves, to crucify ourselves. That's a misnomer. That's a misunderstanding. In Galatians chapter 5, I think it's verse 24, uh, it says, Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust thereof. And what that means is, if you are a believer, 
you are to consider yourself to already be crucified with Christ. It is in an aorist indicative tense in the original language. In other words, you're already crucified. You're already dead. You're dead to self already. Consider it to be a fact. Let that be worked out in your love life. Placing self last. Sacrificing. But the third expression of love in, the, in, in these chapters is that love is not only in a normal Christian life seen in submitting and in sacrificing, but also in sanctifying. Look at verse 26 and 27 of chapter 5. Christ gave him, he sacrificed himself that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should, the church should be holy and without blemish. You know how love is expressed in a normal Christian life? Here it's in the, in the context of a, a home and marriage relationship. Our relationship with other people, especially in our home, ought to be a sanctifying relationship. It ought to have a cleansing factor. It ought, we ought to be a cleansing influence in our relationship and especially in our home. We ought to have the, uh, the, uh, an influence upon our loved ones that helps them instead of hinders them from coming to Christ. Do you help or do you hinder your loved ones or people in your relationships from coming to salvation, from coming to faith in Christ by the way that you speak to them, by the attitude that you have toward them, or by the things that you do to them? Does your place in the home, does your place in any relationship is it a loving, is it a loving, sanctifying thing? I wonder if sometimes we drive people farther from the Lord rather than bring them to the Lord by the things that we say, by the way that we act, by the attitude that we have. We drive people farther from the Lord and uh, for that reason, they may actually perish because of our selfishness, because our lack of love, because we don't live a normal Christian life. Here's another characteristic of it. Chapter 6, if you'll go with me to verse uh, 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks, the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual entities. Spiritual wickedness in high places in the heavenlies. So take on the whole armor of God, he says. You know what the normal Christian life looks like? It's a winning life. This is all about victory over the enemy. And the fact of the matter is Christ won the war. And the victory over Satan and over all of his hosts, the whole army of Satan. And you can claim that victory. And that's what normal Christian living is. It's winning and not losing. It's victory and not defeat. And then look at verses 19 and 20 in this sixth chapter. And Paul says, And for me, pray that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. I'm in prison for preaching the gospel. But pray for me, verse 20, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The normal Christian life, the spirit-filled life, the Christ life, Christ being seen in you involves a witnessing. It is caring about the lost by praying for them to be saved, but not stopping with praying going to them and sharing the gospel with them.
when he tells you to. You pray for someone, maybe the Lord's saying, okay, you've prayed enough for that person, now go tell them. Go share the gospel with them. Enough praying. I've heard you. I'm with you. Now go share the gospel with them. Don't shirk that responsibility. If you really care about people, if you live the Christian life that's a normal Christian life, a spirit-filled life, you'll be witnessing. You won't be closed-lipped. You won't be uh, afraid to share the gospel. You'll have spirit boldness to do so. I guess to sum it all up, is that uh, a normal Christian life is a life that is resting. I hope you don't misunderstand me, but here's what I mean. Stop trying to live the Christian life. And let Jesus, who is already in you if you are a believer, live his life through you as you. That's normal Christian living. There's a lot of discussion about the new normal when this pandemic is over. Well, the kind of living that we've just considered may be a new normal for you. But it's the only life that makes sense in the light of eternity. And I want you right now to determine that you're going to get back to normal and make Jesus your life. Let's pray. As we bow our heads to pray this evening, before we do so, I want you to think seriously in your heart. Do you really know Jesus as your personal Savior? I'm not asking you if you know about him. I'm not asking you if you know a lot about the Bible. I'm just asking you if you have ever come to recognize that you are a guilty sinner before God and your only hope is to believe upon and receive Jesus and what he has done for you when he paid your sin debt in full on that cross. Have you ever invited him into your heart to forgive your sin and to be your Savior? If you haven't, none of this applies to you. You need to be saved. That's your step right now. If you haven't been saved, why don't you right now, as the Savior waits, invite him into your heart to forgive your sin and to be your own personal Savior for the rest of your life. If you're a believer, back to normal. Back to normal is not just about getting past this pandemic, but back to normal is living a life that is spirit-filled, where Christ is seen in you because you recognize him as your life, and you let him live his life through yours. So, Heavenly Father, as we close in prayer, we ask that you might continue to use the truths as quickly and as simply as we have shared them tonight. Use them on an ongoing basis in the hearts and lives of the hearers, and we'll thank you for it. We ask this to the glory of the Lord Jesus, the name by which we pray it. Amen.